Aloha and welcome to the Condo Insider Show, where we discuss all things relative to condo living. Today we will discuss best practices when maneuvering unavoidable lawsuits. We will provide a perspective for homeowners who either live in their unit or rent out their unit. I'm happy to be joined again by Krista Stadler, who has become one of our show regulars, and I'm happy to say that. And we're also joined by Porter DeVries with DeVries and Associates who is an expert on all things in condo living legal matters. Welcome, Porter, to the show. Thank you, Cheryl. It's my pleasure to be here. Happy to have you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, My name is Porter DeVries. My law firm, DeVries & Associates, is a real estate law firm. We work with uh, condo associations, owners, buyers, sellers, developers. Uh, The center of our universe is real estate because Mm. owning a piece of paradise is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year we were recognized by Law Firm 500 as the ninth fastest growing law firm in the country, uh, which I'm quite proud of. And uh, so we're very excited to uh, be here and uh, glad to be with you today. Well, great, great. And we're happy you're here as well. Um, I know that we all have noticed all the cranes and kaka'ako and all the development and things of that nature. And sometimes what comes with that are construction defects. So why don't we start there? Because potentially these defects can lead to to lawsuits. So um, I'm sure you've seen it all. So if you want to just kind of talk about that a little bit and educate um, associations that may be at a point where they're dealing with construction defects and how you can help them. Yeah, so the construction defect lawsuits are a very big deal. Uh, There is a 10-year statute of repose, which means you've got basically 10 years to find it. Um, a lot of newer properties, everybody's um, buying, happy moving in, excited to be there, uh, and a lot of these defects go unnoticed. Mm. Um, so that 10-year period can go by pretty quickly. It's important for boards to be proactive in terms of hiring experts, tracking complaints, and finding out if there's kind of a pattern of some kind of issue that's, that's coming up regularly and have those investigated. How, how are those defects typically found out? Are, are, are they sometimes, you know, they just stumble upon it because of something else? You know, have, can you give us some scenarios that you've sure. lived through? Yeah, so, you know, one, one case, you know, I lived through was discovered by, as, a, as a result of a fire. So there was a, a fire in one of the unit's garages. And, you know, up until this point, there had been you know, no other issues, no reason to investigate and look into anything further. But after this fire, the insurance company came in, their adjuster was investigating to find the cause of the fire and just the extent of damage. And as a result of that, found that there was a fire blocking issue throughout that entire unit, which was part of a yeah. sixplex. And we, you know, further investigation discovered that it was part of the entire project. So throughout, we had these fire blocking issues. Um, fortunately, this was right at the end of the ta- tenure limit. Yeah, so that's kind of lucky and unlucky. So what happens yeah. if you don't find it out? After 10 years, you're just out of luck? Is that how that goes? Uh, almost, you, yeah. Almost. I mean, there are, there are certain situations where you could get around that. You mm-hmm. know, the, the mm-hmm. statute of limitations or statute of repose in this case um, can be told for some reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, all of those are judicial decisions and really fact-based. And mm-hmm. so it comes down mm-hmm. to really what that specific situation is. When those type of things occur, um, you got to get you got to go through that litigation and and get the funds from the builder or mm-hmm. the developer. But in the meantime, you've got this issue that could potentially you know this could happen again if it's not resolved. Mm-hmm. So, is there a cost to the owners? Is there an assessment? And very potentially, yeah. So that raises a very interesting legal issue in terms of you know do we fix this now? You know, while the lawsuit's pending, while we're going through mediation and arbitration and all of those steps and those years and Mm -hmm. expert investigations and all of that, do we fix it now or do we wait until the association's been successful and we have insurance proceeds that can cover the cost of that? Uh, It's a tough decision for boards to make. I think it comes down to health and safety and Mm -hmm. just the legitimate risk of it happening again. And so if, you know, a board were to decide that you know, this is pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to fix it now. They'd be looking at probably especially assessing the owners for that. Which is never fun. Yeah. Definitely yeah. not. Yeah. And if one of those situations occurred, let's say in that situation with the fire, someone had actually been injured or 
God forbid, you know, passed away because of it. That would be a whole other litany of litigation that would take place probably against the builder, separate from the HOA. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. somebody's estate or somebody who's been injured by that would be, that's outside of mm -hmm. the association's domain. Of course, anything that I'm comes sure up it's... in a lawsuit like that can be used in the, the association's potential lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, that's yeah. tough. Yeah. You have quite a few of those going on right now? Uh, you know, there are a lot of construction defect issues. Um, they slow down a little bit just mm -hmm. because of that 10-year period. You know, after 2006, you know, construction really slowed down. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, I, I think there's, things are picking back up just with new constructions having been completed in the last five or six years. But yeah, there's definitely a slowdown there. How, how, what are some other type of assessments that occur and, you know, that you've, that you've found? I would imagine with older buildings, you, would, you know, you could have an assessment for new elevators that are needed or elevator mm -hmm. systems or parking structures or, I mean, I can't even, roofs. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, you name it. If, yeah. The, yeah, if the association reverse, reserves are insufficient to cover a necessary repair or something new has been discovered, one association uh, who discovered that all of their old metal pipes have rotted and deteriorated mm. to the point where they had to be replaced. Um, That's so they pretty were, common. Yeah, yeah we've seen a lot of those. With the elder, those cast mm -hmm. iron pipes are starting to fail. They thought they would last 50 or 100 years or so, and they're starting. Yeah. Nothing lasts forever. Yeah. Nothing does. Yeah, mm -hmm. which means that you will probably start uh, having to go out and get bids for contracts and things like that. And I'm sure in some cases there are potential um, liabilities when addressing or dealing with contracts, either breach of contracts or things like that. So do you often help boards navigate uh, contracts and reviewing contracts, which I always advise that you know, homeowner associations should always let their attorney review the con any major contract before they sign it. Just make sure the, the fine print is serves them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is great advice. And yeah. Music to my ears, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunately too frequent that, uh, that boards get into contracts without having it properly and thoroughly reviewed, and it only comes to my attention when there's an issue when, there's when a we're problem. trying to fix something. And then we go back and find that, you know, this term is just completely ambiguous. It means one thing to us. It means another thing to the contractor. And, you know, we end up in court trying to get somebody neutral to decide to, what that to means. Decide. Yeah. 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 So getting into a contract, you know, it's not only just the specific terms of it and getting clear on what those are, making sure that it serves the association's interests. Um, but it's also ensuring that there aren't any conflicts of interest mm, to ensure that, that the board's making a great decision that's at arm's length and that's in the best interest of the owners. Uh, you know, it's a small state. Everybody see, has interests in other places, and sometimes boards get themselves into contracts where, you know, although it might be indirect, they're benefiting from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, your office, you serve all islands, we do. correct? And you're probably, are you seeing more lawsuits on one island over the other, or are there types of lawsuits that are more prevalent on one island over the other, or it's just, just depends on the board? Well, I, I think the, the main differences between islands are just the, um, on Oahu, we see a lot of resident based issues you know mm. we've, we've got full-time residents mm. you know on a higher basis a higher percentage here on oahu as opposed to uh, the outer islands and so we've got people living here we've got people who are kind of more invested in where they live and so there's closer attention being paid to what's going on uh, and so with that then you know we'd be on outer islands where it's more investors more yeah. just second homeowners snowbirds, snowbirds mm -hmm. that you know, they're not paying as much attention. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have a board of the only people who are full-time residents in an association. They're the only ones who volunteer and can actually serve. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they get themselves into trouble just playing favorites, working among themselves. Do you find, just some, some backup here for all of you out there in TV land. Porter and I have known each other for, I don't even know how long. Several now. years, yeah. Quite a few years, and mm -hmm. I've worked together in Kona, and he was my actual 
corporate attorney when I sold my company, and you did a fabulous job. Nice. So happy. Thank you so much. But because Kona has newer developments, well, now, like you said, they're getting into the past the 10-year, do you find more of the defects in the Kona, you know, on the Kona side of the Big Island than here in Oahu, or is it, or there's, is it similar? I'd say similar. Okay. Uh, you know, there are the defects in, in association cases here on mm -hmm. Oahu, I think, are larger in scale mm. um, you know, on whole. Yeah. That's, you know, kind of a general statement. Though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. Yep. I'm going to come up with some other good ones. We have a whole bunch of them for you. So as far as um, you know, association dues and board members and their responsibilities, can an individual board member be sued by an owner yes. for something related to board activity? Have you seen that happen before? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with that right now, in fact. There, really? It, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's not uncommon, unfortunately. Um, but the, the question comes down to, well, so let me back up. You've got a claim from an owner against an individual board member. Mm -hmm. you know, the first question is, or were they acting in their capacity as a board member, yes. or were they acting in their individual capacity outside the scope of their um, their service on the board? And you know that question really defines then whether or not the insurance coverage, the DNO coverage that hopefully the board has, is going to step in to provide coverage for that director. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the an important first question to. to figure what out. mistakes? Well, there's two questions I have regarding the board members, and I'm just on the periphery of everything that happens with the association side of the company I work for, but there's, there's always so much encouragement for board education, board mm -hmm. training, for them to understand their responsibilities, their fiduciary responsibilities, how to conduct themselves, things that can get them into trouble, which I think is mm -hmm. fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you love that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, what... What kind of mistakes have you seen someone in a position on a board make? Maybe this will help folks out there keep themselves from going down that path. Yeah. What type of mistakes have you seen them make that you would advise them not to do? Sure. So, you know, one is you know, a big one, I would say, is self-dealing, you know, where you've got uh, a board member who's kind of making decisions that really just benefit him or herself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. Whether it be yeah. where they're living, like, yes, I want this little plot of trees because my view is going to get expanded or right. things that are, yeah. Yeah, or, or they're taking, they're spearheading a ch uh, change to house rules or they, they take up some, some kind of cause that really is only benefiting them. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones who are really that invested. Every, all the other owners, all the other directors are really kind of not that engaged in it, maybe mm -hmm. not paying as much attention, and this person kind of rams something through. Can they change a house rule without having a vote? No, the board would have to approve it. And, and so that's why I was suggesting that other board members maybe aren't paying as much attention to it um, just because this one person's really that uh, excited about it. Right. Good stuff. We'll continue after the break. Um, so thank you for joining us. And please come back, and we'll continue to the discussion. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us again. We're just going to jump right back in and continue our discussion with Porter DeVries. 
impressed with myself. I'm getting it right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just discussing some of the legalities or some of the legal issues that boards sometimes get themselves into trouble and how you help them navigate some of that and best practices. And I think where we left off, we were discussing potential uh, outdated house rules, or we were going to segue into that, I think. Um, and so do you want to kind of talk about like when it is a good time for boards to update their house rules and things like that? Or yeah, absolutely. And the process sure. when doing that. Yeah. So house rules are a great thing to have, but they can also be a curse. They're the lowest on the totem pole in terms of enforceability. Uh, and right. that's because they're only, they can be made by the board and the board itself, you know, board alone without owner input necessarily. And so Unlike the bylaws and the declaration where you need um, a vote by the ownership. Correct. It doesn't really seem fair, but. Yeah, exactly. That everybody has to live by out of a 400 unit complex and five people are making the decision yeah, on, on right. how you're going to, what you're going to put on your lanai and how you're, you know, you know, all those little yeah, details. All those little details. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, those come down to the house rules, which because the own, not all of the owners have approved them. Um, they're sometimes unenforceable. You know? mm -hmm. So it's really about, I mean, the board needs to be interpreting its governing documents, the bylaws, the declaration, and interpreting those things to add clarity that helps the owners with understanding what they can and can't do. Um, some of those things are just policy decisions that come up. You know, there's a new issue that everybody's facing. You know, in recent years, it's been service animals, it's been medical marijuana, things oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, you yeah. know, those things started out as house policies. And, right. you know, turned into laws. I mean, we have statutes now that provide protections for those and rules and processes to go about that. Yeah. But they started out as house rules as people start bringing these things on properties and boards have to start dealing with them. Mm -hmm. They have to start dealing with them and they should always run them by their attorney. You can't you say can't, it enough. Thank you. You cannot <laughs> say that enough. I hope everybody's hearing that. Yeah, and then yeah. I believe you have to give 30 days notice before they're enforceable after the attorney has signed off on them. Yeah, that, the, the yeah. board needs to put these out to the owners. They need to be presented at a meeting so that uh, everybody's aware of them. And yet there's a, a phasing period for them to be effective. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, I would think that would kind of be in alignment with any type of fining policy and things like that. Because in my experience, I've seen couple of fining policies that once you get in front of a judge, they're deemed unreasonable. Mm -hmm. So another reason to vet, have your attorney vet all these things to make sure you're not being unreasonable, not being selective in right. enforcement and things of that nature. You don't get a pass because you're the president or anybody else on the right. board. So I think that's pretty important too. Yeah, you certainly don't get a pass. I mean, the condo laws are written very favorably for the associations. It's a difficult position to be in. The boards are, yeah. you know, they're all volunteer. And these people spend a lot of time to try and make sure that their communities are well-managed, well-funded, and good places for everybody to live. Yeah. And that's commendable. But there is the risk of being arbitrary, uh, being uh, overly burdensome. Mm -hmm. you know, some of these rules, uh, as you mentioned, I've, I've seen those house rules where the fining policy is pretty much out of control. Yeah. And there's a balance there. You know, sometimes you want to have a fining policy that's pretty stern because ideally that's kind of a in deterrent. the back of people's minds. It's a deterrent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it prevents people from getting into that. But if you then take it so far as to let years and years of uh, interest and late fees pile up and then you're in front of a judge trying to say, you know, judge, this is all very legitimate. Well, that yeah. might not hold up. Yeah. You know, it might be there as an, a deterrent initially. Yeah. But to really follow through and press that when it yeah. gets to be a pretty extreme amount compared to the relative value of the property, right. that's where you might have issues. Yeah. Do, you, do you recommend uh, a number of warnings, like first warning, verbal, or, or posted to your door or whatever, second warning, written, sent, certified mail, and then, okay, third warning, $50 fee, sec, you know, then you just progressively moving up if whatever it is hasn't been resolved. I mean, do you recommend having, because I've seen them go tier. straight to the $200 fine before yeah. there's even any warnings given, which doesn't really seem fair. Yeah, there are a whole range of different policies that are out there. And the reason for that is that these are written into the Declaration and Bylaws. 
Oh, and that's where it all starts. Deep. And that's why they aren't standardized. Um, you know, a lot of the management companies will have their process of you know, one letter, two letters, three letters, and after 90 days, they turn it over to the association's attorney. Yeah. But some of those kind of standard policies are limited by what's in the declaration or bylaws. And so, you know, if, if we were to rewrite everybody's declaration and bylaws, I think that would be a great rule that just kind of set as, you know, the baseline for you get three notices and then this is going to the attorney. Then we have a defined period of when you can have a lien filed against the property and mm. so forth. For outstanding debt. Right. So, so if you did stop, seeing something happen in your life due to illness, loss of a job, whatever it might be, and economy shifts, and up to what point, you know, one, two, three, six, nine, twelve, how many months typically on average go by before any type of like eviction to that particular owner, or does that even happen? Yeah. Or, or taking over the unit? Yeah. Well, so just to be clear on terms, an owner wouldn't be evicted. Um, oh. Tenants get evicted. Owners have to be foreclosed on, to lose their interest in their property. They can get that lien foreclosed. So if they reach the point of having a lien filed against their property, mm -hmm. that lien can be foreclosed. The association can go through that process judicially or non-judicially and take the ownership interest from that owner. Take possession. Um, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you explain judicially versus non-judicial versus non-judicial to the, per the layman? Sure. Expensive and cheaper? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, to some extent. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, so some of it's cost, and, and but most of that comes down to just the time it takes. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes well, it takes a number of months. Uh, you know, I don't can't put a for either on that. one of them. For or? either one of them, mm -hmm. um, you can do a non-judicial foreclosure. I once mapped out like every single deadline. If you met everything to a T, right. You know, you could get this done in you know three months. Oh. And non-judicial is typically not before a judge, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's what that means. So getting back to the terminology, non-judicial means that we're outside of the court system. This mm -hmm. is just happening pursuant to statute. Mm -hmm. So there are notices issued. There are notices published in the newspaper, a public auction held. And all of these things are defined by statute. But there's nobody looking over our shoulder mm -hmm. and watching what's going on. Uh, there's just the kind of back-end enforcement. If there's been something uh, improperly done, it would come back later on. An owner, ho however, who is in the middle of a non-judicial foreclosure can petition to have this brought into court quite easily. So there is that protection. Not there. as much teeth in it then as, right. as a judicial. Right. Yeah, I mean, a non-judicial is better suited to an owner who maybe has just completely disappeared. Okay. You know, somebody mm -hmm. who would just can't no, find. No fight coming yeah, back. Yeah, there's no risk of them coming mm -hmm. back, and you know, there really isn't a defense there. Um, that's that's where non-judicial is best suited. Uh, that does happen. Yeah, does, yeah, but most often these are in the case of just not paying your maintenance fees. Your maintenance fees get behind, opposed to exorbitant fines or anything like that. Typically. Right. It, right. Typically, have you seen it's, both? it's kind of a combination of both in a way. Oh. So, like what happens, I've seen a lot of these where an owner will get fined for something that they think is completely unreasonable and they are not happy about it and so they are not paying it. And mm. yeah, we've all mm -hmm. seen that. So, you know, it piles up, it piles up and, and builds and builds and builds. And then they start getting these letters and, you know, somebody gets more and more upset with their association they're going to be less participatory, less responsive. And at some point, the board says, you know what, we can't hold this on our books anymore. We need to do something about mm. it. Yeah. How does the priority of payment come into play with that? I know that's a touchy subject lately it's because changed. it's yeah. changed. And I don't even know if it's set in stone yet. So if said homeowner, if you will, thinks that this fine is ridiculous, I'm not going to pay it. I know in the past, the association, whatever payments they make towards their maintenance fees could be applied to legal fees and fines and things of that nature. But I don't know if that's still the case. Right. That's changed. That's changed. Yeah. So yeah. the legislature passed new legislation, updated the statute so that priority, the old priority of payments tended to be, we'll pay the oldest thing first and pay the legal fees. Mm -hmm. And so an owner could never really get caught up mm -hmm. and they'd always be assessed a late fee on their maintenance fees, interest on those maintenance fees, even if they were still paying something. Those 
kind of a never-ending yeah. you know, hole digging going yeah. on. Yeah. And so that's what the legislature was addressing there. What we have now is that um, an owner can designate that the payment they make is to go specifically to their maintenance fees. Allocate it yeah. towards the maintenance fees. Yeah, so if they indicate on their check, for example, this is for my maintenance fees, it's the exact amount for the maintenance fees, that has to be applied to their maintenance fees. You can't apply it to anything else. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's good. Yeah, and so that eliminates some of those situations where we've got ballooning fees and interest all based on you know one um, fine or, or something that was yeah. imposed yeah. earlier. But a good rule of thumb, um, if you want to dispute a fine or anything, is to just communicate with the board, and board should always provide a platform listen to owners and give them the opportunity to either remedy or in some cases waive maybe you know they're mitigating circumstances and you know they'll, they'll give them a pass but you should just never like with anything else ignore it it's not going to go away <laughs> right no. yeah, yeah ignoring it is never a good policy yeah um, you're absolutely right communication yeah. is number one here and rational and reasonable communication. Yeah. I would qualify oh, it a little bit. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of ranting letters that get sent, a lot of ranting emails, and kind of harassing emails that come day in and day out. Yeah. You know, these are difficult for property managers to deal with. Yeah. And, and if the issue gets moved over to legal counsel, you know, it's hard to say that, you know, we're dealing with somebody who understands the actual issue or why this happened and who would be willing to work on settling it or working on a payment plan important to just communicate reasonably and rationally. Yeah, yeah, it's always a good practice too to um, show up at the board meeting and participate mm -hmm. because then you, you, I think you get gain a lot more insight into the entire process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so good stuff. little mini democracies, they yeah. should all be operating as such, which means that everybody has to participate. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I know we're coming to the close of the show and we could continue, you know, we can go down a rabbit hole of all the experience that you have and different types of scenarios. But And he's coming um, back. And you're coming back yeah, we'll in January. Up. Yeah, in January with, 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 with Krista. Um, I think this is a good time. Why don't we share with the audience that starting January 2020, um, Krista is going to host a show on Condo Insider. Yes. Very yeah. excited, and it'll be primarily related to, you know, property management from the rental aspect. And I've got some really great people yes. coming up, and yes. I'm actually going to be interviewing Cheryl to find out more about her experience and background somewhere down the line here. Yeah. I don't think we've picked a date yet. It'll be so. fun. We're having fun. So please continue to come back and join, join the fun. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.